All right. Well, while that's happening, there is going to be a link appearing in the chat in case you would like to see the live captioning. And in the meantime, let me just welcome you. I am Mary Peabody. Today is day one of our three day uh, dive into uh, research <clears throat> into farm labor and management and the decision making practices and all of the other things that go along with that. And I and a whole bunch of unbelievably talented people have been working on this issue for quite a few years now. You're going to meet many of them over the course of the next three days. Um, today, Jason Parker is going to be uh, presenting. Um, and we've actually had two rounds of AFRI grants, and we are in the final stages of the last one. So we thought it was important to start thinking ahead about, uh, you know, sort of what the next steps are. We also know that there are other people doing research out there, and we sort of wanted to create an opportunity for all of us to come together. And at the end of the day today, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, some general discussion questions um, and maybe keeping, uh, you know, with an towards maybe developing a community of practice or a learning network around this so that we can all get a little bit more uh, organized around what we're doing and working together uh, so that we're not reinventing wheels, but we're really uh, taking care of some much needed um, information out there for farmers. So with that today, I'm going <clears> to <throat> turn it over to Jason Parker, who is going to talk a little bit about some research that he's been working on for us. And then I will be back um, and we will have some general conversation. And please feel free at any time to draw drop questions into the chat. We'll be keeping an eye on that as well. So Jason, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Mary. Uh, good, in, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I wanna thank each of you for taking time out of your day for our webinar on farm labor. You know, we've worked hard to make this series interesting and I hope informational. As Mary said, I'm Jason Parker. I'm a lecturer of sustainability and rural society in the School of Environment and Natural Resources at Ohio State University. Uh, with me virtually is Kayla Alvis, who's a PhD student in rural sociology in the school as well. Now, I'm an anthropologist by training with over 20 years experience working with small and mid-sized farms on a variety of issues across the U.S. Although we have significant sample of interviews, our emphasis is on the world of knowledge that farmers and workers have shared with us and not the averages or means of specific data points. I hope to bring their voices to you as we learn the things that they find important and share how they perceive their work in their careers. But first, I just want to pause and thank all of those farmers and farm workers that did share their stories with us. Today, we are going to talk about both sides of the labor relationship, the farmer and their decisions to hire workers and purchase equipment, and the professional farm worker and their decisions for choosing a farm, choosing to farm, the challenges of farm work and the goals that they hope to achieve by working on a farm. Farming is a challenging enterprise and there's always more that needs to be done than there are person hours in a day. And for many reasons, we hope to make clear this problem is compounded on small and mid-sized farms because of the nature of family life and farm work, sharing the same spaces and people who are accustomed to doing it all themselves. A family business can have enough conflict and issues that arise without bringing outsiders in. And so these factors often make it difficult, both for members of house, farm households to recognize that they need additional labor, to appreciate the value that additional labor can bring to their enterprise, and to take the step to seek that additional labor outside of their household. Because indeed, Bringing a stranger to a the farm is a challenge beset with many barriers. The barriers aren't merely identifying how much to pay or how to train, but to understand and accept that the non-household person will need specific training because they're unlikely to understand the seasonal flow of work on this particular farm or come, come prepared to anticipate what is needed and when. Things that are obvious to those who have spent years farming. To be fair, we also engaged a number of new and second career farmers who had varying experiences with these particular challenges, yet they encountered some of their own as they started farming. 
I want to outline that our primary goal is in choosing to focus on produce farmers and professional farm workers was to understand how expectations and needs of these two groups could be aligned. Produce farms were chosen because they tend to be the go-to for new and beginning farmers due to low land and capital requirements, but they often have their own high labor needs, as we will discuss. And these are difficult to meet. Our second goal was to examine the potential for more socially sustainable labor relationships on smaller scale farms by making the details of these relationships more transparent to avoid replicating some of the same issues that larger scale operations tend to have. When we approached the topic in, I said 2013, that's kind of a guess, farm labor was one of those issues that most acknowledged was difficult to find, expensive, a headache even, yet critical to operating most farms based on farmer skill set structure and scale. Even today, farm labor is often a topic we resign ourselves to dealing with, yet we don't do much to consider the characteristics of labor relationships and the factors that can help improve them. So we conducted over 100 interviews with farm labor experts, individual farmers, and farm workers. The individual farmer interviews were coded and analyzed, but we're still working on some of the worker interviews. If it seems like we are focusing more on what farmers can do, it's because we are. Uh, their efforts structure the positions and create the work. In many of the study states, farmers reported direct marketing being limited in similar ways to those identified by extension and research. Market saturation increases competition and limits sales at formerly reliable venues. Direct marketing, while often being seen as a starting point for farmers to identify their strengths in markets, sometimes feel like there are limits to how much can be sold that way, particularly those who are looking to scale up. And finally, many recognize that not every farmer is a people person. There are a lot of barriers to scaling up for small and mid-sized enterprises that are interconnected with the processes of concentration and consolidation in our food system. This is commonly understood by farmers we interviewed. Yet it can't be taken for granted that these processes influence the availability of farm workers in a given area. Rural spaces filled with larger specialized farms and older farmers relying on machinery aren't ideal places to find the multi-talented and available workers who many small scale farmers seek. It's also important to, to remember that labor isn't a person, but a relationship between at least two people, farmer and worker, manager and employee. Each side has needs that they attempt to fulfill and expectations for the other to follow through on. The characteristics of this relationship shape whether these needs and expectations are met, as we will discuss. So most farmers gave only general descriptions of costs and benefits of paying more for skills, purchasing equipment to enhance worker productivity, or even replacing labor with equipment. They were hoping we had those answers. Farmers present their situations as extremely tight, difficult to maneuver because of money and timing of seasonal tasks and are often resigned to the difficulties of hiring and continually training new employees. So we worked with farmers, farm labor experts and extension and consultants and identified six key areas contributing to finding good workers. These relate to whether farmers have done the necessary preparation to take on employees, things related to the style of management that a farmer uses, local best practices for recruiting workers and knowing what they are, understanding the legal issues regarding certain types of employment, awareness of gender and age issues in the workplace and dealing with those differences in communication styles among genders and generations. A seventh concept, professionalism, 
was identified by some of the consultants that we spoke to who felt that farmers really needed to be willing to do and learn what they need to know in order to operate their business. What we learned from individual farmers and farm workers through the interviews with them went even deeper than this. Hearing from farmers who have worked to balance their values and goals, we identified five areas for them to try to assess before they look to hiring outside farm labor. It's sort of a farm labor checkup. Uh, the first is looking to see what is important to you. Many farmers think about this, but to formalize that process. Do you have a philosophy? For instance, is money a top priority? Are you looking for more income? Do you like to grow things and work in the soil? Do you have a philosophy for farming with an ecological or community or family orientation? I'm sure that these apply to many farmers, but there may be one that's driving the farm more than others. The next is to look at what the goals are for farming and for the people in your household. How do these match the needs and capabilities of those people? And what about other household needs like domestic work, household or health care, child care, elder care? Who does these? What work needs to be done and how can you make it something that someone would want to do? Identifying your labor needs. How is the work distributed across seasons? Are there reasons that you have for assigning certain tasks to employees that you may not want to do on your own? And how do these tasks affect people physically and mentally? Identifying labor in your community. Where could you go for outside help? Sitting down and going through the process of what are the towns and schools and colleges, internships, local advertising, staffing agencies even, um, career fairs. Yes, somebody mentioned career fairs. Uh, and then also knowing what's your competition? Who are you? trying to hire against? Um, is it fast food? Is it construction and landscaping? Are there other farms that you're competing against? And then number five is sort of a management style assessment, sort of clicking on that professionalism idea. Know thyself. What is your style and how do you best work with people? What do you need to know to operate your farm? And does your personality match being a manager? Farmers were aware of the different farm labor categories and had priorities for hiring based on pay, how hard a person works, being able to find workers, the softer people skills that they may have, the skills a worker brings to the farm, legal constraints of each of those categories as well. For many, a primary focus was wage, hardworking and also independent. Yet each category of worker has different needs and expectations and as a farmer, we should be considering whether or not the position we create is a good match for that. For instance, interns need interaction and education, as do volunteers whose tasks also need to be relatively easier and low impact. Farmers we worked with shared a blended sustainable agriculture identity that included many of the common descriptives and characteristics that we think of being one's own boss, hardworking and putting in long hours, not compensating for all their time and not taking benefits, yet striving to maintain an egalitarian work environment. Now, this combination of qualities can make some parts of the worker relationship difficult as people who self-exploit are likely to unintentionally do the same to others. And avoiding managerial roles may lead to confusion and frustration for some workers. The characteristics of farmer identity can conflict with needing to create structure and protocols for hiring, training, and managing other people. And rather than embrace the role of boss, many of the farmers we talked to saw managing others as just a barrier to doing what they enjoy. That's working in the soil and growing things. Farmers also had very high expectations for their workers that were sometimes a mismatch for the types of positions that they created 
and we're hiring for. Seasonal, sporadic, or inconsistent and part-time positions with low wages and a lack of interest on some farmers' parts in training employees or learning the HR tools needed to manage them was often paired with the desire to attract highly skilled, independent workers who were willing to put in the effort needed to make the farm successful. Now, this is understandable given the pressures and constraints of fruit and vegetable production and creates an opportunity to evaluate the types of positions that a farmer creates. Many farmers reported wanting to have this egalitarian environment on their farm with fairness for all employees. They sought employee input, identified strengths of their workers, and attempted to hire employees that fit in. These were the successful farmers at hiring and retaining. And they emphasized communication and otherwise tried to maintain a degree of equality. Other farmers shared that they had a hands-off approach of showing employees what to do once, then let them figure it out so that they're able to do it on their own and may even begin to self-regulate, saying that you sort of have to be flexible and roll with the punches, is what one farmer said. Sometimes life gets in the way, you have to make adjustments. Now, farmers also acknowledge the difficulties matching workers to the types of positions that they offer. Some did this. Seasonality and inconsistent work, life event changes that change worker priorities, low pay and even location of the farm were all factors that they saw were beyond the worker's control. Several farmers noted that they don't have formal job descriptions and even lack standard operating procedures for hiring. These are problems for farmers and workers because it makes it difficult to, clear, to have clear expectations of what work on the farm will be like. Now, farmers were split on the types of training they offer. Some worked with employees to identify skill sets. Some did this and worked alongside new employees. Well, still others gave pointers while assigning duties without regard for worker skill. Employees reported that the best experiences were with farmers who took the time to identify skills and to train them. While all farmers did some form of training, some felt that training wasn't worth the cost and time because of the challenges that they had with retaining workers. And some had a feeling that some workers were just uninstructable, their term. For instance, this Ohio farmer who said that they had hired a lot of different people over the years. And there were some people who were just uninstructable. They would stab themselves in the hand with a knife, even though 10 minutes ago, I showed them how to use it. They're untrainable. A Vermont farmer relayed to us that training is a challenge because it obviously takes resources and people come and they stay for a while and then they find something else and leave. So for farmers, training is very time consuming. So farmers also made note of several issues with finding good workers. These included the cost benefits saying that they're expensive for what they do. Some worker personalities are more difficult to manage than others. Workers often come with romantic ideas of agriculture and sort of idyllic images of working on a farm. And then there's issues of communicating across generations was a challenge, including moderating smartphone use in the fields. Drug and alcohol issues came up, but those were minor. Workers were very perceptive. They come to farming for specific reasons. I understand that farms are looking for what they're looking for and need done, and certainly provide deep insights into the goals and expectations they have for working a farm job. 
end the season to end pragmatic expectations for their ability to continue that work. Further, workers shared the role that personality and managerial competency and the duties that they are used to create positions or jobs play in attracting and retaining them. They often had strong opinions about farmers, never talked negative, um, but strong opinions about farmers that they'd worked for. And many professional farm workers have plenty of experience to support those opinions. And these opinions included challenges to farm work that range from the general physical labor and difficult weather to the challenges created by uh, farmers and how they deal with the adversities of their own enterprises. Both farmers and workers discussed the relationship between specific tasks and job satisfaction. Yet many farmers differed in that they were resigned to accept that these were inevitable. While workers had suggestions for taking control of the type of tasks, duration of those tasks, the conditions of the tasks that make up a farm worker position. In the hiring process, workers shared their experiences being hired on different farms and how the interview process and hiring were influenced by farmer experience doing this, and whether farmers were planners or what they referred to as panickers. Planners looked ahead of the season with a plan and a contingency plan for farm tasks and hiring, while panickers tended to scramble through the season moving from one crisis to another, sometimes shortly after the season begins. And workers were often keen to understand when a farmer had planned or panicked just based on their own hiring process. And they also shared how local labor markets could shape some of these outcomes. So farmers and workers described the same recruitment experiences, which is what you would expect since they're really both in this together. Uh, the easiest and likely most traditional were the word of mouth experiences that was successful in communities where social networks continued to connect people. Now it's worth emphasizing that word of mouth always involved a social network because that became a critical factor for folks finding these jobs. Um, others looked at Craigslist, Calm Food, Good Food Jobs, and a host of other state organic and sustainable farming organizations like OFA and NOFA. None of the employers or employees reported providing health care benefits to their regular employees. That was generally seen as unaffordable. However, both sides shared some overlapping lists of other benefits that made their positions attractive. The list included obvious benefits such as competitive pay, not just with other farmers, but other competing industries that might be nearby. And snuck in there the socializing. Yes, workers come to farms to socialize. They enjoy working with others who share a common purpose and embrace that interaction. Farmers can also be difficult to work for as many don't have good people skills according to their workers. Because of this, they aren't the best at asking questions that they want to know. And so they don't always get the answers that they need. Workers who were given detailed hiring, training, and expectations appreciated the efforts and were keen to share how these made a difference in their experiences. More experienced workers understood that some of the reasons for being hired was because of their experience and they expected to receive less training, but the training was still always appreciated. Now, job stress was the biggest reason employees were dissatisfied with work. Workers identified multiple challenges to farm work that, continue, that contributed to job stress. These ranged from typical weather related and farm work complaints of hot, hard work, stoop work, and long days to the sociological explanations of farmer and coworker personalities, leadership qualities, planning and human resource capacities, or the lack thereof. Sources of that stress also tended to include bosses who were reluctant to make timely decisions or 
a cause of stress for workers because that often created more work later on. Workers were additionally stressed when decisions were delegated to them without clear expectations. Workers reported the physical and emotional toll that needing to know and be good at everything had on them. Now, this was common among workers that were a part of a small crew or the only non-household worker. They shared the stress they felt that came from having a large number of simultaneous tasks that they were responsible for on a produce farm. And this is something that they would report that you don't always have in other industries. Things like planting and cultivating, planting, weeding, harvesting, cleaning, packing, marketing for different crops going on at different times. Many of the workers we interviewed saw many missed opportunities where things just fell apart, uh, but could have been saved if there was a backup plan, a contingency. One of the compounding mistakes they reported was panic hiring. When a farmer tosses out hiring protocols because they're desperate to hire someone. Assigning tasks without regard for weather was also a common problem that stressed workers with physical exhaustion. They felt balancing tasks with regard to the weather would help reduce unnecessary strain. For instance, if there's nice weather outside um, and it's hot, greenhouse work may not be appropriate. Obviously, they also recognized that there are times when you couldn't really make those decisions. Workers also talked about farmer idealism and how that can push them too far. And while they accept the stress and consequences, this can make it very difficult to work for them because it affects their disposition and behavior. That's one Ohio farm worker pointed out that from the outside, they looked like they were doing well. Then once I started working for them, I began to realize that they really weren't. And they were so stressed out. They worked all day, every day. Our food system really doesn't support the small farmer and a lot of them see it as a principled and ideal community and sustainability, but it's almost like they're becoming martyrs. Workers tell us that farmers can be cranky when things don't go as planned. Big surprise, this happens to all of us, which is why workers emphasized planning tasks for the day and week to help workers be more efficient and less stressed. Employees felt the better experiences were with farmers who fostered a cooperative team-centered environment. These farmers also hired workers that were a good fit for the crew. They tested them. Likewise, farmers who acknowledged and deal with their own personality flaws turned out to be better bosses. We all have personality flaws and dealing with them is what workers were asking for. Among the qualities workers look for in their jobs are personal characteristics of the farmer. These were really important to them. Being able to plan out work, have clear expectations of what to do and how to do, how to do it, offer learning opportunities, provide timely feedback on the quality of work, enjoying working with others are all management and teamwork skills that they felt made good leaders. Most white workers understood the financial limitations of pay and thought that good bosses are the ones who find ways to reward their employees in other ways. So on other projects, including those with large scale farming operations, we've heard from farmers that many workers leave because of personality conflicts. They cannot perform well in weather and heat and are not up to the long hours and hard work and don't have the dedication that's needed. Workers tell us that much of this can be addressed with good hiring and training processes, good communication and good management. We learned that there are people who make careers from working on farms and some who simply enjoy it part-time and that these folks chose smaller scale farms because of the environment and social interaction with the people they choose to work with. It's a two-way street. 
as this group of workers, we were able to tap into <clears throat> are looking for more than just a wage. Many long-term workers are in this for the experience and education they get, the opportunities to learn the system of farming and how it connects to other parts of the food system, even just for curiosity, and the joy of growing something and being outdoors. As noted, they do not, however, idealize the work for others, but they do find it rewarding. Okay, thank you, Jason. So any questions? If you have questions, you can unmute yourself and ask your question, or you can type it into the chat box. Uh, let's see, we've got, okay, we've got a question. Great presentation. One of the quotes you shared mentioned a worker share program. Have you explored if or how well worker, whoops, worker share programs improve relations for both the workers and the employers? This idea of the work share program is something that's come up, um, but in the US, I don't know anyone who's actually doing that. Um, I ran into some folks from the Netherlands at a conference a few years ago that had talked about work share programs. Uh, and that some of these programs are actually run by the state. Uh, if you wanna go on a vacation, you're looking for someone to take care of your farm, you can work with the state. I'm not saying that's the type of program we want here, um, but there are those other places that are, have been experimenting. Okay, and were there, uh, was, whoop, wait a minute, was there an average amount of experience the farm workers had? So it seemed like we had two groups of farm workers. Some of them had been at it for around a year to five or six. Um, and then the other half was more into the, what I would consider professional. They'd been at it for 20 years, uh, some of them, you know, seven to 20 years. Uh, let's see, can you say more about hiring? What are some of the best practices you identified? So in the, the hiring practices, the farmers that I think had the most success were the ones that really thought about what is the job that I want someone to do. Wrote it down and share that as part of the hiring process, a job description. And in fact, one of us is gonna be talking about that in the next two days. Just job description generator, I believe. Yes, so, so this is a good time because there is a couple of questions here looking for very specific detailed recommendations. And let me just lay out how this three days works. Um, Today, we're talking with Jason about this, this sort of uh, research that sort of created the foundation and the framework for the rest of the work that we're going to do. Tomorrow, we're going to talk a little bit about the, um, the tools that we have available in the farm labor dashboard why they're there, um, a little bit about, um, you know, sort of the practical applications of trying to train farmers in, in labor management. Uh, and then on the third day, we're going to hear um, from two more. Uh, we'll hear from Kathleen Liang, who will talk a little bit about her experience in North Carolina working with farmers there, who are very often uh, limited resource and, and farming um, on, on a very different kind of a scale. And then we'll also hear about um, a SARE project that has been looking at sort of uh, forming different types of um, shared worker kinds of programs. So we'll be hearing about that. Uh, okay, let's go back. We've got some questions <clears throat> here. Um, whoops. Was yeah, there a, uh, signi a significant difference in responses from new versus established farmers? Yeah, so one of the things I didn't get into was um, on just the farmer side, there were some differences between sort of the new and beginning farmers and more established uh, and some of their responses. And uh, these also kind of aligned with uh, their entrepreneurialism too. Uh, established farmers tended to be looking to do more of the same, but scaling up, whereas new and beginning farmers were coming in with all kinds of ideas. But then there's also a third category of second career farmer. Uh, these folks came in often with a lot of other sort of human resource management, people uh, skills that they brought with them from another career, uh, but didn't know a lot about farming. 
So each of these groups seem to have some strengths and weaknesses that they have to negotiate with. Okay, and did farmers identify good sources for HR and labor management training that help them be better managers? Kind of builds on what you just were talking yeah, the, about. Yeah, the most outside of the second career farmers, folks talked a lot about uh, state level uh, sustainable food and agriculture groups uh, like NOFA and like OFA here in Ohio um, and going to their conferences and participating in those. Um, there's also been some talk about um, for the newer and beginning farmers, some of them referenced the new farmer training programs as well. Uh, but none of them really talked about going to the business world and finding HR resources and bringing them to their farm. Um, okay, what do your next steps look like in terms of bringing those, oops. Hang on, my screen is jumping. In terms of bringing those voices, experiences, and values together so that farmers and employees know what conversations you've had and can potentially react to that information. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and really that next step is taking the stuff that we're talking about over these next three days and breaking it down into I hesitate to say fact sheet, but something like that, that can be shared with Farm and Dairy, which is a publication here in Ohio, and other types of private publications that have a readership um, that highlight certain points and ideas uh, that are tangible that somebody can work with. Uh, sorry, I was skipping ahead. Um... Is this research published? Is there any way we could look more into this research? Currently, it's not. Um, <laughs> and someday it will. Uh, that's my goal. Uh, and actually, um, I will thank Beth for the prompt from the interpreter service, uh, because instead of just rehearsing and sharing slides, I wrote a script. And that moved me one step forward it's the first time that I've done that, actually write something out. So it moves me one step forward to getting that published. And let's see, I think that clears everything up. It looks like Natalie, it looks like people are responding to your immediate needs yes this is this is not nor was it ever intended to be a um a farmer workshop on like solving immediate labor problems so um if anybody's got suggestions in the oh, central ohio area for natalie um, please check out the chat and give her some some assistance there and it's 20 minutes of, so I am going to go ahead and put um, some discussion, general discussion questions up. Because as I said at the beginning, our, um, one of our goals is to, this, this is a wicked problem. I mean, this is a huge problem in agriculture right now. We've heard that this is a pain point from both farmers and um, farm workers over and over again. Um, it's getting in the way of farmers' ability to scale up to the size that they ideally would like to be. So, um, you know, we're very interested in continuing to explore, explore this, but as some of you alluded to in your questions, these are wicked problems. They, they embrace issues of social justice, they embrace issues of um, legal issues, as well as tax and financial implications, um, as well as, you know, an awful lot of management and human resources is embedded in sort of those soft skills. And quite frankly, farmers don't always get into uh, farming because they are eager to sit at a computer and drive a, uh, com or drive a computer and sit at a desk all day and or, um, you know, do the sort of high level communication that's required for really good um, employee management. So 
uh, the list of questions and issues is large. The need is there um, and we are excited to help engage. So to the extent that anybody wants to respond, I would love to know sort of, you know, what are the biggest labor issues facing farmers and ranchers in your region? Uh, and again, I invite you, you can either unmute or you can go ahead and um, type it in the chat box. Whoops, except I can't see the chat box if I'm Um, a chat box, I think we covered it. Um, did the issue of conflict resolution come up during your conversations? What were some of the main issues? Sorry, was that was that a question for Jason? <clears throat> I believe so. It's okay. from one of the yeah. participants. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, conflict management came up from the farmer perspective much more than um, and how to deal with them or the difficulties in dealing with them much more than um, they did from the workers side. Workers tended to focus more on um, if that came up, it came up in the context of the personality of the farmer and how they handled In fact, some of them talked about having farmers take the perspective of this is how I am, just deal with it. Uh, whereas there were a lot of farmers that were concerned about how to handle conflict issues and, and the sort of taking aside and having those separate conversations and nipping it in the bud rather than letting it fester um, were big on the minds of a few of the farmers. And so they, they took the strategy of addressing these things early but in a calm way, um, pulling farmers aside, never calling out in front of, uh, you know, sort of having an audience for, uh, but having that sit down, maybe the kitchen table or in the milking parlor or something like that. Um, Jason? Yes. Another question. One of my biggest issues is workers' comp insurance. Any advice here? As a small farm, this is about 5% of labor. Yeah, that's that's a tough question. I I don't know that I have an answer for that. I'm guess, I'm guessing um, that might be in response to my question about what are the biggest labor issues facing farmers or and ranchers in your region, Seth. Aha. Uh -huh. Then I retract that, Jason. Mary. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> one of my biggest issues. Oh no, is I don't have come. an answer. I'm just asking for I'm just taking oh. a census here of like what are people seeing out there? What are the pain points? And I've I've heard uh, I've heard workers comp come up more than once, so I'm not so surprised to see that there. Am I being a helper or a nuisance by reading this, Mary? I find it helpful. All right. So then another one is, uh, in addition to the biggest issues, labor shortages compounded by high living costs in the local area. Um, and then there was uh, one of the participants, Ron, gave a, um, uh, a link to a paper on uh, labor shortages, um, lack of affordable housing for farm workers who are hired as seasonal workers is a big issue. Lack of affordable employer subsidized health care options for small farms is the biggest issue impacting my farm's labor recruitment, longevity, and retention. It's huge for me and the growth of the success of my farm. Excellent. Great. Thank you, everybody. Anybody else want to jump in on that one? If not, we can move to the next question, which is, you know, what are you seeing uh, in terms of gaps that exist in farmer training and technical assistance around labor? What's being offered in your region? Is there adequate training, not enough training, could be more, could be better? And we have also heard from a lot of people around the whole country about the housing issue and, and basically just the, um, the tension between how we're going to pay uh, livable wages on farms when many of these same farms have extremely small um, profit margins that they're working within. So we're getting good response here. Um, not enough training to the gaps. Another gaps is, uh, involves 
farms I've worked with have replaced human labor with machines when possible, which is uh, one of the topics in our next grant that we have, or Mary has with our team. Uh, and then Beth talks about tomorrow's presentation will take everyone um, on a tour of tools and resources at the new farm labor dashboard, all of which are designed to help people be really strategic in their labor decision making and steps towards effective hiring, training, supervision, and retention practices. Um, farm Commons has been mentioned earlier. It's a great resource for hiring information, absolutely. And this person has relied on it for a lot of uh, general advice as well as technicalities. And I will just say that Rachel will be here on Thursday uh, with Jennifer Hashley to talk a little bit about this project that they've been working on uh, regarding labor as well. So we are a big fan of Farm Commons as we are Rubens. <laughs> Rubens the sandwich. Correct. Uh, let's see, there was something else I wanted to, oh, Michelle, if you could give us a little bit more information about where you're located and what kinds of farms are replacing human labor with machines when possible, that would be hugely interesting to us. And the next one is, um, you know, are you seeing any innovative programs, ideas, or pilots in your region around, you know, getting adequate numbers of workers on farms? Is there anything of interest that you'd like us to know about? That's a great question. Hey, everyone. This is Ron Strolick. Yes. Hi. I, I thought I would get off Zoom and actually... <laughs> <laughs> be like a real live voice <laughs> exactly um, you know one program that um that we are looking at i'm at the university of california one of the programs we're looking at is um, called the equitable food initiative it's a certification program that some of you may be familiar with and uh, they have a set of standards it's mostly for larger farms so might not be that applicable um folks here, certainly in terms of the cost, it might be a little prohibitive. But one of the really interesting things that they're doing is that they create as kind of a, um, a requirement for certification, farms have to create what they call labor um, leadership teams. And they're basically like a labor management team that's comprised of, you know, everyone from, you know, the grower down to the lowest farm worker. And the growers that we've spoken with have found it a, a tremendous resource in terms of, um, improving communications with workers, getting the word out to workers. Um, and also for workers, they really love it too because they, it's kind of a vehicle for them to talk about things that they would like to see improved on the farm. And partly it's compliance with the standards, but also a lot of it is just very small things. Like, you know, this fence over there is too close to the field and we don't have enough room to work or, you know, just things like that. So that's, um, I encourage folks to look into that. Um, and, Say the you know, name just, one more time, Ron. For it's called the Equitable Food Initiative. Okay. Yeah, I can. Uh, I'll put it in the chat as well. That would be great because I would love to follow up with them and because yeah, that sounds like a terrific idea. Yeah, from what you know, we've been doing some research on it, and it really seems like a very positive and kind of promising model. So, again, um, it is a certification program, but I think people can kind of borrow from it without necessarily having to get certified. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Anybody else have anything? Um, maybe this is a response to a previous question. Michelle did um, expand that is Northwest Ohio and greenhouses are replacing farm workers with mechanical arm robots to plant seeds and trays in addition to conveyor belts. So they've gone from 100 to 30 for their labor force. Um, and then Sarah's working with fellow colleagues in Wisconsin to develop a peer-to-peer -peer labor management training program for diversified organic um, farms and um, vegetable growers, that is. Um, it'll consist of modules and topics like hiring the right people, motivating your employees, farm culture, working through conflict, etc. It'll have templates um, to utilize after the fact. We're aiming to offer the first training in February of 2022. And this came about through farmers' interest in strengthening these skills and attracting and keeping workers from season to season. Hillary writes, Hillary has a question for Jason. Jason, are you ready? Are you seated? Yes, he's I'm prepared. Ready. Perfect, here we go. I'm writing as a mini um, ethnography 
I'm writing a, a mini ethnography for an anthropology class. I'm a dairy management major. I was wondering if you had any suggestions and how I would gather information or how you specifically gathered your information in your research. I would like to focus on the issue of retaining milkers and dairies. And I would like to learn why a milker would stay or leave. I know that a main reason why workers leave would be to work in the fields for seasonal work. One of the things I'd consider in that is um, access to, to the milkers and, and being able to have that conversation. Uh, I imagine you would have to approach the, the farm owner or manager to be able to figure out who those people are that you would talk to. And use, uh, you could either use a participatory observation approach. Um, you could rely just on interviews if you want. Um, I, don't know much about the particular area of dairies that you're talking about. Are we talking about um, English speaking workers or maybe there's another language that you would need to be able to, to interact with? Um, other things that come to mind is how you frame that question. I don't want to go off on a tangent, but um, there is sort of a whole anthropology of technology that looks at how the technology shapes relationships among people that you could be looking at as well. If you want to send me an email, parker.294, osu.edu, I'd be happy to have a longer conversation about that. Jason, if you might put your email in the chat and you do charge one Reuben and fries per consultation, <laughs> but the first hour is free. So um, then we have another one about a program being done in the Northeast, um, and there's a link to it. It's a farmer training program that provides interns to mentor farms. I think PASA has something similar. Kathleen Lang says the Center for Environmental Farming Systems offers several programs in supporting guest farm workers in collaboration with the A Mexican organization. Um, we translate all training materials into Spanish. You could find more information on our website, and that's the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. Jason put his um, Aaron, uh, email in, and Hillary thanked Jason, and we are now up to date. Thank you, Seth. So yeah, in the last few minutes, we have time. I mean, please feel free to ask any final questions or um, anything else that we didn't ask you about farm labor that you think is an issue or that might be worth um, some investigation. And while people are, are responding to that, I will go ahead and just introduce you to our, our whole team. Again, you'll be hearing from most of us throughout the week, but uh, you just heard from Seth and uh, Kanisha Reynolds is also, they represent New Hampshire. We have Kathleen Liang from North Carolina a t We've got Jason, who you've already heard from, and Kayla from Ohio, Ohio State, the Ohio State University. We have John Hendrickson from Wisconsin. We have Aaron Yoder, who is our um, our equipment and ergonomic and engineer a spectacular and he is from Nebraska and then we have Beth Holzman who you've all heard from and myself from Vermont so that's our team um, we would invite any kind of communication from you at any time and thank you so much to those of you who are dropping links in it makes it so much easier to follow up on these great resources so any other comments questions uh, curiosities um, Maria says, nicely done today. Very interesting. We like Seth the best. Um, then a bunch of thank yous. They didn't actually say the Seth the best part. I mean, we, we know that. Yeah, Seth. yeah. Um, and then sure. a lot of thanks in there. And so. Yeah, excellent. So, um, yes, thank you. Keep those links coming. And just as a preview of coming attractions again, tomorrow we'll meet at the same time, same link, and we will be talking about the farm labor dashboard and, um, the <clears throat> opportunities and challenges of trying to build a site that can actually provide some uh, Mary, grounded oops. help for farmers. Yeah. I apologize for everything. Can we share the chat with all the links in there, um, asked Ron? Um, yes, well, we can share that. We can certainly pull the chat out and pull the links out and put it with the recording and the slides. Excellent. And then we have an invitation. So. Uh, um, 
I am a new assistant professor um, and extension economist. Oh, we love extension economists. We wish we had more. Um, at North Carolina State University, my research and extension are centered around agricultural labor issues. Feel free to reach out if you want to chat about the topic. All right. That sounds great. I bet somebody will take you up on that. Okay, so thank you all so much for your time and hopefully we'll see some of you back here again tomorrow, if not, maybe on Thursday. And if not, feel free to reach out to us and stay engaged in any way that works for you. And with that, I think we are done. So Beth, you can stop recording. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Beth. Yeah, and thanks. Hey, Mary. If they're already married, how are they going to stay engaged? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>